Good afternoon, um, colleagues um, joining us from various parts of the world. And I say this because we have colleagues joining us from outside the country. Therefore, as the UFS, uh, the University of the Free State Library and Information Services, we are very privileged. Uh, with your permission, um, colleagues, uh, if you can just give us a few um, minutes to admit um, the people. As I see, there's quite a number of people on the lobby. I think we can start. Um, good afternoon once again, colleagues are uh, joining us from uh, various parts of the world. And I say this because we have colleagues joining us from outside the country. Therefore, as the University of the Free State um, Library and Information Services, we are very privileged. Um, the, da the day is finally here. And um, as uh, they say, we shall rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Dina Mashiani and I am an assistant director of um, the Uni University of the Free State Library and Information Services, situated at the Neville Alexander Library at um, the South Campus. Um, first, to give a bit of, of background, this is a discussion where we'll be engaging in dissecting fake news anatomy to understand this phenomenon uh, further. In commemorating um, Youth Month during a time of crisis, it is befitting to engage in matters that are affecting youth and those around them. This discussion has been inspired by the daily exacerbation of fake news created and distributed in various channels, more particularly on social media platforms. Um, the discussion aims to address and answer questions such as um, what is what does the impact of, of, of fake news have on social media usage and the youth? And um, also, who is responsible in keeping the spread of this um, infodemic? And also, what, what, what can be done uh, to sensitize and, and, and raise awareness to the communities to guard against uh, the spread of, 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 of fake news, including the, consum the consumption of, of, of fake news? And um, lastly, what are the conspiracies behind fake news? But um, these are just some of the, qu the, 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 the questions or issues that we'll be addressing. The, the, hopefully, they'll be more based on the e engagement with, with the, the panel members. And um, colleagues, as, as the University of the Free State LIS, we are privileged to have a panel that consists of individuals from diverse backgrounds and fields. Uh, for this particular discussion. And um, our panel members consist of Dr. Collins Chiseta, who is a lecturer and researcher in the field of information mm -hmm. sciences. We also have um, Lisanda Nazo and Luan Dileshezi, who are students at the University of the Free State. We also have Dr. Mvuzo Ponono, a lecturer in communication sciences at the University of the Free State. And lastly, Mrs. Catherine um, Langsford, and national chairperson of LIDASA, which is the Literacy Association of, of South Africa. And she's also a, PD, a, a PhD candidate at the, the University of, of Cape Town. Before we continue, colleagues, I'd like to hand over to uh, the, the University of the Free State um, Library Director, Ms. Jeanette Molopiani, to, to um, welcome everyone and to open the, the, this session officially. Over to you, um, Director. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mashiani. I hope everyone can see me. I'm in the shack, I'm in the bed, back room. You know, you, 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 you try to find a comfortable space uh, working from, from home. So you can see I'm in the back room, in the shack. So I'm enjoying my work. And uh, I just want to welcome everyone on our virtual platform. We are really looking forward to a stimulating discussion. And, and as we, 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 we speak about, you know, we, we talk about fake news. Uh, uh, two weeks back, the country was abuzz with the birth of 10 decapulates. You know, it made international news. So you can see that, you know, fake news can even infiltrate mainstream uh, media. So the, the discussion today is going to guide the narrative as to how, you know, what tech, uh, 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 approaches can be used to make sure that, you know, people safeguard, people decipher what is uh, 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 true and what is not true. And in this, and I like the fact that, you know, we are linking this to the youth of our country. So, and it links very well with the youth month. You know, the youth are the people who, you know, liberated our country, uh, looking at what uh, transpired in 1976. I think then I was doing sub A. By then we, we, we call them sub A and, and, and sub B. You know, it's what grade, your grade one and your, your grade two. So here we are today. We are going to be inspired by our, 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 our Dr. Uh, Chisita, uh, you know, Dr. Ponono, you know, Nazo and, and Shezi really and, and, and the other colleague Dina has just mentioned who's, uh, the name is not read on the on the on the in, on the program, but we are looking forward to that stimulating discussion. Feel free, colleagues. This is our platform to engage. This is our platform to have that a scholarly a discussion and debate around you know issue because you know we know the impact. Looked at the damage. I mean, of a simple story that was, you know, circulated, you know, there, there was jubilation, it was on BBC, it was on, you know, on, on the top, you know, top uh, news agencies of, of the world, only to discover what, and what about the reputation of our country as a result. So welcome, and, and, and in the process, because I know that, you know, somebody is going to do a vote of things. I also want to appreciate the team that has put this um, a, 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 a webinar, a discussion together. I am I'm, I'm really, really very proud of what you have done. So from my, uh, uh, from my chair where I'm sitting, I just want to say thank you, colleagues. Feel welcome. Let us engage. Let us, you know, have a debate and then we'll see what transpires after this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you uh, for officially um, opening this um, platform for, for uh, both our colleagues and our panelists to engage on this, um, the infodemic that we're currently experiencing of, of, of fake news. Um, before we, we, we continue, colleagues, as we all know, each and every house has 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 rules of, of, of conduct. And as such, um, kindly note the following housekeeping rules for this uh, discussion. Um, kindly note that the session is, is recorded and the link will be shared with uh, all the participants. And you will also be able to access this um, recording on the uh, UFS Library YouTube channel. Um, and also um, note that um, each panel member will be given 15 to 20 minutes to engage with us on the on the fake news phenomenon to share their opinions and 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 views relating to the main theme of this um, discussion. And uh, we also kindly um, uh, um, ask you to 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 hold all questions until all the panel members have had the time to to engage with us and. Um, kindly jot down all, all the questions or comments that you might have and uh, we're going to open a question and answer session after each and every panel member has had the, the opportunity to, to um, 
to present. So um, in terms of, of the panel members, it, they're going to present in this order. We're going to have um, our first panelist, who's uh, Dr. Collins Chisita, um, then followed by um, Will will be followed by Lin Lisanda Nazo, and um, thereafter, <coughs> sorry, we'll have uh, Luandile Noloazi Shezi, who will be followed by Dr. Mvuzo Ponono, and lastly, we're going to have Ms. Uh, Catherine Langsford. And um, colleagues, now please welcome me to to uh, welcome um, our first panelist, uh, Dr. Collins Chiseta. Dr. Chisita is a researcher, an editor, an author, a lecturer in the information sciences at the University of South Africa. He has worked with local and international organizations, including LIASA, which is the Library Association of South Africa, Zim Zimla, the LIAS, the AFLIA, and the IFLA. He has uh, general publications. Um, he has published in both local and international journals. And he also has book chapters, conference papers, and also ha he has also presented in uh, a number of webinars relating to topical issues on libraries and related institutions and emerging technologies. Over to you, Dr. Chisita. Oh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, hope you are feeling fine. Um, thanks a lot for this. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, present on this uh, phenomenon of fake news, but mine is more of uh, an epistemic overview uh, of uh, fake news and its impact. Uh, generally, we can say that we are living in the information knowledge age where the amount of information uh, is so much that it overwhelms our abilities and our capacities uh, to uh, you know evaluate it or also to manage it. Uh, it's a, a era which whereby uh, the speed and uh, low cost at which information can be created, reproduced and delivered uh, has become so astonishing. Uh, it is also an age whereby uh, information has become weaponized. And uh, it's an age whereby we face what we can say numerous uh, technological challenges uh, with regards to, uh, you know, this overwhelming phenomena uh, as evidenced by such issues like, uh, you know, techno obesity, communication overload, uh, information overload, uh, and all the other overloads that are, you know, characteristic of this uh, particular uh, era. Um, and uh, when we <coughs> look at uh, you know f f f fake news in social media, uh, we find that social media is uh, the in thing, uh, and uh, most of the youth, as well as you know various demographic groups, uh, you know make use of these uh, these platforms uh, to communicate, uh, to also uh, you know uh, you know sharing ideas and etc. Uh, these platforms, we can say they are like a double-edged uh, sword uh, because they've got both positive and negative uh, impact. Uh, this positive and negative impact uh, can apply to both uh, adults as well as uh, young people. For example, you know, these are platforms for helping the youth to stay connected. Uh, they provide support uh, online that they can uh, make, uh, you know, connections uh, they can also share uh, ideas, advice. Uh, they can also access answers relating to their career objectives and link up with various other sources. There are also uh, uh, platforms for sharing knowledge and also, you know, they stimulate creativity and they are what we can call sites for establishing uh, contacts. But on a negative uh, uh, angle, we can find that uh, these are, there's also the problem of social media addiction uh, which also leads to isolation. Uh, there are also issues to do with cyberbullying. There are also issues to do with the privacy and uh, the fact that such sites can also become what we can call fatal grounds for information disorder, crime, and also health-related problems such as digital uh, fatigue. Uh, right. Uh, furthermore, uh, this 
phenomenon of fake news is uh, something that became more popular, especially during the 2016 uh, era. But all along it has been there, but it was not as popular as it was. Uh, it entered into public discourse due to a complex matrix relating to, you know, politics, you know, advertising, uh, ubiquitous uh, computing, proliferation of digital technologies, and etc. Uh, it's mainly associated with concocting stories on digital platforms, maybe to any money or even for ideological mileage. Uh, the uh, concept was fomented by the U.S. presidential election uh, and also brought into political communication by Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And it covers everything that we can think of uh, from misinformation, spin doctoring to conspiracy theories. And uh, it can be you know, created and shared or reported through the multimedia uh, platforms like uh, you know, uh, these social media uh, websites. Uh, then furthermore, how do we define this fake news? Fake news relates to uh, articles that are intentionally of and verifiably false and could mislead readers. Uh, it's a new form of political misinformation in journalistic accounts. So there are various definitions I won't uh, be devil, but maybe the last one is intentionally misleading, biased representation you know, information for the benefit of the one who is sending uh, the message. In other words, uh, the one who is uh, uh, communicating that message. Uh, this phenomenon has been with us since historical times, uh, because wherever people coalesce in, into social groups, there are always issues to do with the power and social control, whether the social control is informal or uh, formal. Uh, as long as you know people are in groups, there are issues to do with the power and control. So some form of mind game and political games. Uh, it has been there since you know pre, uh, you know pre and post printing era, like the Gutenberg phase, where Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1450, and it has been there even through the age of mass media and the current uh, internet uh, age. Uh, the key issue there is the use of information as a source of power, uh, and uh, the digital platforms become the vectors for spreading these uh, fake news. And uh, uh, its popularity is, you know, become, uh, uh, you know, a phenomenon because of the ease of use and, uh, you know, ease of use of digital technologies uh, to share uh, content and to share also, uh, you know, ideas. Uh, therefore, this it's, fake news is referred to as a word according to the Collins uh, Dictionary, but uh, it's a word with two words because we've got fake, then we've got news. So it has earned uh, a place in the uh, Collins Dictionary, uh, despite the fact that uh, most words that we know, they consist of uh, one word. Uh, uh, that was in 2016 uh, that it ended that, uh, uh, that throughout history they've been selected cases of fake news. For example, you, rumors, rumors of war, false stories that maybe uh, lions are going to come into the city and people run away even though maybe it's, it's a hoax and there is a disclaimer, but people usually believe it since it's coming through the media. Uh, uh, in 1522, there was a satirist, uh, Aretino, who used these wicked sonnets and pamphlets and plays to blackmail former friends. And also there was uh, hoax issues in uh, America uh, where someone claimed that a balloon, balloonist had crossed the Atlantic in a hot air balloon in only three days, yet it was, it was fake. Uh, and also recently there was this, uh, uh, you know, announcement that uh, there were weapons of mass destruction uh, in the Middle East and uh, the bigger countries went and invaded only to discover that uh, uh, it was fake news. So there are so many examples of uh, uh, fake uh, uh, news. Now, what are the impact? People, it's an only that it's, it's, it's a belief that people are likely to remember fabricated information, even though they were witnesses to these cases. Uh, it, it also is uh, impact in the sense that it damages a country or organization re reputation or image. And it also becomes a source for generating uh, conspiracy theories. Sometimes it can lead to loss of life or it can also lead to poor decision making, uh, poor health, uh, information services, and also results in uh, what we can call un unhygienic information uh, practices. And this can be very detrimental uh, now, what are the characteristics 
Now, characteristic is that we look at volume, variety, and velocity. When we look at the volume, we consider, let's say, the internet enables everyone to reproduce fake news on the internet. And the variety, we look at uh, what are the types of fake news, like rumors, satire, news, misinformation, malinformation, whatever. Then velocity is that uh, uh, fake news, sometimes it's, it's short-lived. It uh, does not uh, stay longer. Um, now, throughout the world, governments have had to respond to this, especially in, uh, considering the current uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its infodemic. Since the World Health uh, Organization uh, declared that uh, the world was not only fighting the pandemic, but they were also fighting the, the endemic, the infodemic. So they were fighting two wars uh, on different fronts. Well, fronts. Uh, governments have responded globally there's been an overdrive to pass bills laws and punishments uh which now have become a common phenomenon uh whereby uh, anyone who shares uh, uh, false information about covid and shares information if you are not authorized to do so you become criminalized so there's been a, a, a criminalization of malicious uh, coronavirus uh, falsehoods for example uh uh, states like Hungary and South South Africa also and uh, uh, UK and etc. They've come up with these laws. And this has become global. Uh, uh, there's also been uh, you know uh, an enactment of anti fake news laws in various countries. And uh, different countries have laws that deal with uh, fake news. For example, uh, here in South Africa, the Disaster Management Act. Uh, is one of them, and uh, Botswana is with Emergency Powers Act, uh, and uh, various other countries. Malaysia has also had its anti fake news act, which was uh, controversial, and uh, uh, I don't know whether now it has been enacted because there were uh, problems with regards to because some of the acts undermine the you know constitutional rights, fundamental rights to rights and freedoms, you know, freedom of expression. Uh, and etc. and association, but however, since it's a disaster, sometimes you know disasters are viewed differently from you know normal situations, and uh, you know governments view uh, you know <clears throat> their institutions as a, a biological organism whereby an impact of something cancerous can uh, uh, you know, uh, corrode the whole uh, biological entity, hence the need to pass some laws in order to deal with the, uh, the issues at hand. Uh, now, who are the creators of these fake news? They are real human beings, like we are there, and also non-humans. Uh, non-humans includes in sort, sort of like what can social bots and the cyborgs. I think you've watched the film Cyborg. Uh, social bots refer to computer algorithms that display human-like behavior and automatic interact with human beings on social media. Cyborgs refer to real human beings who are key sources of uh, fake news uh, diffusion. And, uh, you know, generally, these are some of the creators. Uh, right? There's been, what is the misinformation, especially on social media, like with regards to COVID, because that's the topical thing. Like, this, for example, the peddling of fake viewers such as saying that uh, gargling lemon or salt water and injecting yourself with the bleach can cure the virus. Uh, there's also been false conspiracy theories that the virus was engineered in an experimental laboratory in some other country there. There's been also a, a conspiracy that a 5G network is causing or exacerbating symptoms of COVID. Uh, so uh, the truth becomes devoid of authority or expertise or real facts. And uh, this now uh, creates the problem of uh, fake news. Uh, right? Uh, the conspiracy theories are also flourishing as the COVID uh, you know, ravages. Uh, and uh, these conspiracy theories, they span uh, demographic strata and uh, political differences. And uh, they've always been there fascinating people for ages. Uh, while some conspiracy theories can be harmless, uh, some may even uh, be, you know, entertaining, but, you know, there are those that relate to life and death, and these are really dangerous.
because they affect the individual and the collective well-being of the society. For example, uh, in this era of the pandemic uh, and the infodemic, the COVID pandemic and infodemic, uh, uh, joking with these issues of life and death becomes very uh, dangerous and, uh, you know, cantankerous to the extent that they can really cause, uh, you know, uh, the demise of, of, of uh, uh, the society. Uh, COVID-19 has pushed this discourse on, on, on uh, 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 conspiracy theories and fake news, uh, as you see through when you read through uh, newspapers and other various media platforms. Uh, these uh, theories, conspiracies and fake news, they thrive mainly in situations of a crisis, fear or uncertainty, and uh, then uh, they proliferate. Uh, right? Furthermore, uh, we find that uh, online sensationalist and conspiration, conspiratory sites, uh, uh, you know, generate more engagement than reputable sources such as WHO or the Center for Disease uh, and Control. People are more interested in the sensational and conspiratory uh, information that they can get uh, from these uh, sites. Uh, for example, these conspiracies like uh, COVID is a hoax, uh, COVID is a bioweapon, uh, the governments are using this emerging situation to pursue their anti-democratic goals, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and also, uh, people saying, uh, you know, when you do swab tests, uh, it will also result in you being uh, infected, right? Uh, I'm rushing over this because I want to give... Uh, so how do we empower young people? We empower them by mobilizing young people, by, you know, giving them media literacy skills. Uh, and also multimodal uh, information uh, literacy skills uh, and uh, incorporating of media, digital literacy and meta literacy skills at all levels of the curriculum so that people are able to think critically. Uh, and also there's been a proliferation in the development of fake uh, news uh, toolkits like eFly has got one and etc. And also there are internet literacy courses uh, on how you can uh, detect uh, fake news. And um, we also find that uh, apart from these strategies, uh, we also have the, one of the most critical uh, strategy is the meta literacy. Uh, this is uh, all along we've had, you know, information literacy, digital literacy, but meta literacy now is a new pedagogical methodology that instills critical thinking skills. And uh, it, it resonates with other literacies, like let's say digital, social media literacy, visual literacy, uh, trans literacy, uh, you know, cultural literacy, financial literacy, because it, it encompasses all the literacies because it was discovered that dealing with an issue like the current scenario of the pandemic and infodemic, you needed a, liter a, a literacy which was more integrated and holistic. So meta literacy is that integrated and holistic literacy that has been adopted and it's been recommended so that it's not only taught at, 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 at uh, 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 you know, adult age, but even at kindergarten uh, age. Uh, Right now, why do we talk of place emphasis on meta literacy? It provides a, pro a valuable alternative for weaponized learning in multifaceted internet interconnected worlds like the weird wired world. Uh, it also promotes responsible use of social media, and uh, it promotes ethical use, production, and critical analysis of on online information. And it's an uh, uh, all encompassing, you know, a, a, a tool. Uh, or pedagogical method to deal with uh, the problems of the uh, current uh, phenomenon. Uh, it, what does it achieve if we adapt it? It will actively help us to actively evaluate content while also evaluating one's own biases. So we can also evaluate our own, uh, you know, idiosyncrasies, foibles, uh, etc. It also helps us to engage with all intellectual property ethically and responsibly. Uh, and it helps us to produce and share information in a collaborative and participatory environment. And also it, it gives us, you know, a power to meet life long and life wide personal and professional goals because it is based on the principles of lifelong learning, life wide, life 
wide learning. You see, that's why it has become uh, the most uh, common. And it also deals with the major, uh, you know, cognitive and uh, affective and behavioral domains uh, as, as, as we learn. Uh, right. Uh, then furthermore, another uh, strategy that has been recommended is what we can call, uh, we refer to it as, uh, you know, psychological or communication inoculation against fake news. So just as we are inoculating ourselves against COVID, uh, we also need to come up with a strategy on how to inoculate uh, people against fake news. This can be done through a theory which is known as the uh, psychological inoculation theory. So uh, this theory is, you know, borrows from the medical uh, science theory, whereby we say uh, if when we inoculate a virus, we, we weaken a virus to the point where it will not make the person sick, but it will trigger protective responses. So similarly, also in uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, this infodemic, we can say that uh, you can use the theory. Uh, which is also known as persuasion inoculation, uh, where a strong challenge, let's say in a conspiracy theory of fake news, is weakened to the point where it will not change the person's position or even the person's health state, but it will trigger protective responses in the form of critical thinking skills, as highlighted in the meta uh, literacy, uh, uh, you know, a uh, model. So, in other words, that. Uh, we ensure that the weekend challenges leads to resistance to stronger challenges. So you trigger these uh, protective responses for, uh, you know, developing critical thinking skills. It's also known as pre-banking, whereby you preempt uh, the fake news, you preempt uh, the, you know, uh, conspiracies, and then uh, in, in, the, in that way you are inoculating. And it has been used in such other challenging issues like climate change where people were immunized against climate uh, information so that uh, the world could work together. Then another practice that has been recommended again is information hygienic practices. Uh, this is because, you know, just as we need personal hygiene, uh, which is key to the overcoming this pandemic, uh, there's also uh, the information hygienic practices, which uh, also in everyone's responsibility uh, to uh, deal with. Uh, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I think I come to the conclusion of my presentation so that others can also have the chance to uh, present and I can also have the chance to listen and learn also from uh, other people. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for that um, thought-provoking presentation, Dr. Chesita. And, um, it, it makes one ponder and um, reflect on on the aspects that are contributing to this fake news phenomenon. And from my um, point of view, you you have deliberated on on concepts which are, are assisting in broadening our horizons to better understand, uh, you know, what the, these the elements that that or, or, or issues that are contributing to to uh, the the both the, the the creation and you know the the consumption of of fake news and uh the, there's actually a, a a proverb in in Sipedi that says and i will try to to translate this the best way i can because when it comes to to proverbs and and idioms they tend to lose context whenever they are translated so basically what it means is that you know um when one is expecting guests or, or, or visitors, a, a feast is, is is usually prepared to cater for for the people, and 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 that how that's how people in the family would would also get to indulge through the presence of the visitors. So, with uh, what you have shared, you it, it's a wealth of knowledge that 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 can assist us in in closing gaps that we might have had with regards to, to the fake news for, for, for phenomenon. And you also touched on, on uh, regulations, the laws that uh, can be implemented to regulate uh, the, 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 the spread of, of fake news. And it made me think of um, an article that I once read where the authors were arguing that uh, the, the, the social media influencers are actually the, the super spreaders of, of fake news. 
So um, there was, and there's, there's, there's this lawyer who was, um, you know, deliberating on, on, and he stated that there should be laws that are regulating, um, um, you know, the social media influencers because they have um, quite a lot of, 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 you know, as they get to engage with, the, with a lot of people. So they have influence over a lot of people, and and you know sometimes they can you know from my own 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 perspective, I I feel like sometimes they 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 exaggerate you know they 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 they, they I also agree with the authors that they are super spreaders of 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 information of of fake news sorry, and um colleagues uh with that uh being said, we're going to move um forward to welcome our second panelist, who is um, Lisanda Nazo. Uh, Lisanda Nazo comes from a small town in East London, in the Eastern Cape, and also she's also a third year student studying BCom Accounting. She is also the current prime of um, Emily Hophouse and uh, also an outgoing mentor. Over to you, um, Lisanda. Um, good evening, every I'm sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're good. The first speaker, he was so informative. I think I come from a perspective of actually being a youth, modern youth in South Africa, and how social media has just played such a, a, a big role in terms of fake news. But I also want to start from, you know, how um, we do have, everything has a positive and a negative. So in terms of fake news, we need to start on, okay, what are the positives, what are the negatives of um, social media and the factor that it plays on fake news? So, yes, we have fake news, but they also start conversations, conversations of GBV, how um, sometimes we see one side of the story that people want us to see, but however, it does start the conversation behind GBV, because without those news, whether it be fake or real, they have triggered... Um, an outcry from the youth in terms of actually starting conversations we weren't to be able to, to have before um, this whole thing of fake news and social media. And then also when it comes to the LGBTQ plus, plus community, we started conversations about actually what is that community? What what does it entail? Because I think we've been very oblivious when it comes mm -hmm. to the communities like this. Mm -hmm. And when it comes now to um, social media, social media now forces us into, especially when you see the news about the community and everything that is happening. Now they've created awareness about it so that, that even when fake news come and you've educated yourself to actually know what is happening, what is this community about, you're able to actually stand and say, but no, this shouldn't be right. So fake news has the positive side of it because it starts conversation. And I think that's very important when it comes to social media and the youth today. It also starts like conversations about politics and the economy and just education as a whole. Because as the youth, social media is where we go to actually engage on what is currently affecting us as not only youth, but as a country. So even things like propaganda, the polit um, political parties start. Those are fake news about other political parties, but they've also started a conversation about what is actually happening in terms of South Africa, more specifically, in terms of where are we going as a country, as a government, as politics? So it's these conversations that are eye-openers, although it starts on a bad note that it's fake news, they are eye-openers to have these conversations where we actually do start to question a lot of the things that come from the media because we, are, we have knowledge and we've started that um, point of actually starting the conversations um, on social media platforms. We also acknowledge that fake news has negative impact of it because especially I, when you touch on social um, media influencers, they set some sort of like a pressure or standard to the youth in terms of how they post particular things, how um, you should measure success as a, as, a, as a youth in maybe South Africa. You need to have expensive cars, you need to have a certain degree, you need this and that. And then it, it creates some sort of pressure to the youth that we, in order for you to th think that you're successful, you you need to have a certain way, a certain standard. And it's fake news because they don't actually see, they don't actually show the whole thing of what is success and how it's actually measured. So it does have that, and that results in bullying because now people actually feel like because they don't have this certain standard of living or standard of life, 
they are not worthy or they're not successful. And it also starts that thing of now people start to, you know, belittle and bully people because of these certain standards that have been created through fake news and just how social media makes it seem like your 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 worth and your value is not actually it. Um, it also goes back to invasion of privacy, how fake news, because it's, when we talk about fake news, it's a matter of these are news that haven't been verified by fact or a statement. So people are just letting out an opinion to start a conversation. It could be a, an, an important, like in a, a positive conversation, but it can also be a negative conversation. And basically it, 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 it enables people to now think they have the right to invade a person's privacy and you know, it, um, have this thing of they should have knowledge about what is going on because of social media that it encourages. If you, for instance, if you're a celebrity, you have a right to share every single thing about your life. And the minute people start spreading these fake news and you don't um, stand up for yourself because that's what happens, especially on uh, Black Twitter, then now you feel like, okay, no, this thing could be true, but it could actually not be true. But it's just that people are invading your privacy and because you're a public figure, you have to, you know, account or give back and all those sorts of things. So um, that's a matter of uh, social media. And then a, a social media platform, I do think, is the root in terms of youth and fake news as Twitter, how a small thing that you think or, or you assume is a certain way, you go and tw um, tweet it on Twitter and then it blows up into a whole thing and it could be actually fake news. And it actually ruins a person's, you know, um, reputation. It, it affects people's families, it, 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 emotions. And we talk about, it's a funny thing how as a youth, with the youth, we talk about mental health and everything. But we don't actually think how we actually play a part to enabling fake news that affect other people. Because at the end of the day, people, the, whoever you fake, you, you're sending out fake news about is actually a person or maybe a company and you don't know how it can like affect a person's well-being and we have these conversations yet we don't look back as to we also play a part a part to enabling fake news because if one person a person fake uh posts a, a, a tweet and we don't and we don't ask and we don't actually um you know enable and uh engage in it then it's no longer fake news it's just a person's opinion but it becomes fake news when now people engage and they retweet and the um, social media outlets also start posting it out then that uh, makes it fake news so it's also how we receive fake news that plays a part to actually making it fake news and then affecting someone's life and going back to the thing of now we're bullying and enabling it so i think when it, when we go back to fake news it's a matter of we need to look at okay so we see this is the tweet. I'll, 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 I'm going to use Twitter because I am a, a young person and that's where the most fake news is. You see a particular tweet. Do you then question, actually, is this verified by facts or do I retweet it to make it a hashtag and trend? So I think that is my point of view when we talk about fake news and social media. Um, I think I'm going to give over because I really want to engage and hear more. And thank you. That is all from my side. Thank, thank you so much, um, Ms. Sander, for that um, informative presentation on, on, you know, you have deliberated on, on various aspects that are contributing to, to fake news. And you also mentioned that, you know, um, as much as we see a negative side of, of, of fake news, you know, it, it can also bring, you know, it can start, you know, conversations. And um, I remember there was a time where there were these rumors that, you know, um, 5G was was contributing to to the rapid spread of, of fake news. You know, before before COVID nineteen, I I I really didn't even you know think or, or or know that there was you know 5G. But after that, you know, it it really you know um you know it started that that conversation and and yeah. So you know it 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 it. it it inspires, you know, you know, uh, um, conversations and and so forth. And um, you also mentioned on the issue of of, of invasion of, of privacy. So basically, that also touches on on information ethics, the ethical aspects of of using information. So obviously, a, a person who's not, you know, informed or aware of the ethical aspects of information, they are most likely to invade other people's privacy as far as you know, information usage is is concerned. And 
you know, that can have, you know, um, you know, long term effects on, on people. For instance, we have um, the issue of, of cyber bullying amongst youth. Youth is, is, is highly, you know, cyber bullied. And, you know, you get, you find cases where, you know, young people are committing suicide because of, of being bullied online, uh, you know, and you might, you know, if you, you uh, take a look, you only realize that it, it was just a mere fake news, something that could have been prevented. But because people are not ethically or, or, or are not ethical or are not aware of the ethical aspects of using information, hence they, they you know, invade other people's um, privacy. Okay, um, colleagues, uh, without wasting any more time, uh, we're going to hand over to our third panelist, who, who, which is um, Luan Dile Shezi. And um, she's originally from Durban and currently studying towards a uh, um, BSc specializing in consu consumer sciences. She is very passionate about spreading awareness of autism sp spectrum disorder. Um, over to you, uh, Luan Dile. Um, hi, I don't know if I'm audible. You are, okay, we, we can hear you. My audible. Okay, uh, it seems as... All right. Uh, I think she might be experiencing challenges um, from her end. Luan Dile, can you hear? Uh, can you hear me? Okay, um, colleagues, for for the sake of time, I think we're going to move on to the next panelist. She will just uh, share her presentation once she has um, connected. Uh, we are now going to hand over to Dr. Mvuzo Ponono. Um, Dr. Mvuzo Ponono is um, a Kosa man from the Eastern Cape. Um, he's also a lecturer in the Department of Communication Science and um, a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Center for De Development Support in the University of the Free State. His research interests include audience, post-colonial studies, and small business development. He continues to be in research because of a, di of a desire to use the discipline as a tool for community for community upliftment. This, commi this commitment has led to an, an engaged scholarship program that looks into the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on small businesses in townships. Over to you, Dr. Mvuzo. Hello, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm going to switch my camera on to just the sake that we have to take my, uh, my connectivity as well. Um, <laughs> Just for you to have an idea of what I look like, and then I'm going to switch it off. It might affect my connectivity. Okay. Um, okay, let me get started, not to waste time. Um, I think I come with a very critical perspective when it comes to um, fake news. I can understand the fact that it is a scorch, um, it is um, harmful, and it's, 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 it's something that we have to deal with as a society because we can um, create great harm, as uh, Dr. Jessica um, pointed out. Um, I must also <clears throat> point out the fact that I, I don't have too many ideas in terms of how to curve it, who's responsible for its spread uh, and its impact on the young. Um, I think those are, are various uh, research questions that need to be looked into. Um, what I can, uh, what I'm going to talk about, what I want to focus on, is that um, it, it, my thought point is something that uh, Dr. Shisita uh, again pointed out. The fact that um, uh, there seems to be a tendency of treating this as a new phenomenon, something that just emanated, I think, in 2016, um, and then uh, was further brought into um, um, the, the public domain um, in 2020 with um, the coronavirus. Um, I think it's important uh, to 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 emphasize the fact that since that time, since since time immemorial, we've had uh, instances of propaganda and fake news. And Dr. Chisita again um, <clears throat> spoke about this point. Uh, since printing, since we had the written word, there's always um, a counter narrative to I, I guess truth. 
Um, and in South Africa, I think this um, this, this this reality okay, has existed alongside uh, political dealings for, for the longest of times. And I was thinking about it today, the fact that they are under apartheid, uh, if you are, uh, were a black person who is trying to liberate your country, you were labeled as a communist terrorist, for example. You know? So there was a counter narrative to the liberation struggle. And even before, before those times, um, they, 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 there's always um, a problem, I guess, of misinformation. Um, and so I, I think my, the, the question that arises then is, is why is why has this, this, this thing, this, called this phenomenon of, of fake news become such a talking point from 2016, I guess, onwards? And I think what I say to you is the fact that um, uh, it's, the, it's almost become like a, a moral panic which is you know, a threat to establish uh, uh, values. And hence, it's become uh, something that is you know, implanted now in social consciousness. Um, and uh, I think at, 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 at present, to further answer that question of why now, yes, it is a moral panic. And I guess, why has a moral panic uh, um, um, come up or surfaced of late? And I think it's the fact um, that I think um, the, the social divisions all right, enacted under colonialism in South Africa and the apartheid in South Africa have, uh, come to, have, have come to bear, I think, in, in, in this present moment. Because I think uh, how many years now after apartheid, 20 to 30 years after apartheid, what, we start, what people are starting to realize, you know, and this is, I think, go back to the place we have been part of as people are starting to realize that South Africa has the progress of South Africa come to a standstill. Um, you know, so there's been a failure to dismantle the infrastructure of apartheid. Um, divisions are, are, are worsening, the greatest identification, there's a growing um, inequality um, between races and also between, you know, uh, black people in South Africa. There's growing division here. Um, and so, with that, what then that leads us to, I think that the that sense of that sense of panic, um, which can be misleading um, in a way, because uh, instead of diagnosing the problem of of we haven't really dismantled, still living, largely living with our past, um, we tend to then uh, hold on to, um, I guess, the phenomenon and say this is the problem, fake news is the problem, instead of diagnosing uh, the fact that. Actually, this, uh, this, uh, this problem of fake news comes from the fact that there's so many divisions, so many competing narratives um, in our society. So misinformation is, yes, um, um, a scourge that we, that we battle, like, I think, throughout the existence. Um, but I think what I'm trying to impart here is the fact that uh, the panic is, is because, you know, our reality now is reflecting these deep social divisions that, um, that we deal with. Um, and so what's the, the, and so there, there are narratives and counter narratives because I think with divisions like this, you get like different social worlds. We live in one South Africa, right? And we want to have a sense of like harmony and a sense of we all uh, um, belong to this one society. But the reality is when you look at it from you know, um, post-coloniality is the fact that we've got so many social worlds um, there's like three, there's, there's levels to the society. Um, and something to bring us home that I like using is what um, uh, former President Thabo Mbeki diagnosed, I think that um, way back since 1998, when he said that there's, there's, there's two, there's a sense of truth of Africa, you know, there's one way the middle class and upper classes exist, and there's another one where the working class and the lower classes are. But if you go further in terms of uh, such such a concept, you'll realize that there's not just two South Africans, there's, there's a couple, probably three or four, because of, of the many divisions. Um, and so because of that, each of these social worlds lives with a, a, a certain um, um, a narrative in terms of these are our heroes, these are, uh, and these are our um, um, villains. So if you take um, someone like Jacob Zuma, for example, and currently, you know, um, he's just been sentenced to uh, a year and a half, I think, uh, in jail. You know, Jacob Zuma can be someone, as much as he might be someone's villain because of, you know, how 
um, he ran the country and the fact that some seen as an architect of state, uh, state capture is also someone else's liberator, someone else's um, 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 hero. And, and because, and this is because, as I've said, of these narratives that are embedded within the, uh, the, the country and which have their starting point um, as colonialism and, 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 and post apartheid. And so there, there are so many different ways of, 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 of understanding this, uh, uh, the, the social reality where we currently are. So this one person, for example, can be the confusing uh, idea. And in saying this, it's not to say that. Uh, there aren't examples of, of, of fake news being bad and being harmful for society. There are such instances. For example, I think a perfect story that, that encapsulates what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to get at, is the example of the 10 babies that, were, um, that, were, that made headlines um, recently. So that story, for example, is a classic, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an example of um, what, uh, misinformation, just just, just bad journalism, all right? But I think the, the conversation that has taken, not taken a lot of its own after uh, the discovery that there isn't such um, a happening is the fact that some people see Peter Mpedi as a hero because he's exposed um, um, some things. And then on the other side, uh, people are condemning him because rightly so, he went with a story that was proven to be patently false. So it could be easy on one end to really just dismiss the story and say it's a it's it's an example of bad journalism and should be treated as such and maybe um, the the industry dealing with um, a person who um, um, who who seemed to be wrong it it could be a simple case of that but in South Africa it's not that simple it now uh, it, it it comes out as an issue of competing narratives right because of what I. Uh, of what I've just pointed out, the fact that uh, different social worlds have different ways in which they try to understand um, reality. So my my takeaway from this is that um, um, I, until we start dealing with uh, the divisions um, wholeheartedly, I think we are going to get these instances of 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 of, of fake news, uh, and them not, and 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 this type of news not just being about um, um, people writing false information, but um, but uh, uh, these compete. But uh, uh, the fake news being rather about competing ways of 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 understanding like the world. So yes, um, I agree with with um, I agree with suggestions of literacy programs to educate people about like the dangers of this and and literacy literacy programs to um, I try to get people to be more critical when reading the news. But I also believe in that people have the agency and most of the time um, um, uh, do engage with news in, in, in that sense, all right? So we can't condemn people too much for, I think, uh, believing in something, all right? Because, and that's not to say that they don't have the skill set to read news. It's just, as I said, they exist in a world where it could be true that Z Jacob Zuma is the victim and he's just now being persecuted by political foes. Um, and so I think uh, more than anything, I, and, and I like the fact that this is connected to, you know, um, a youth month and the youth. I think more than anything, what is needed to, I think, combat the more harmful um, aspects of, of fake news um, is, 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 is dealing with uh, the, uh, the, the divisions. And I think um, um, a tackling head on the fact that uh, there's inequality, there's unemployment, what are the programs? Uh, we are going to put in place to make sure as we as South Africa's democracy progresses, um, what we try to curb are the social divisions. I think uh, up until we get to that point and we try to dismantle um, apartheid infrastructure uh, until the point where um, we try to lessen the amount of uh, inequality and, and, and get more people um, jobs and get people starting businesses, we are going to we are going to live in a world that that has um, 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 uh, deep divisions and and a proliferation of, of of fake news because you know that we there's there's instead of harmony in the society there's a greater instances of social conflict. Okay, thank you so much.
Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ponono, for that um, thought-provoking presentation. And you, you um, touched on, on, on a different angle that, you know, most of us are, um, are not actually, you know, familiar or, or realize as something that is impacting on, on the, you know, the, the, the spread of, 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 of fake news. You mentioned that, you know, as long as we still have inequalities or disparities in our societies, you know this this you know the, the the fake news phenomenon would always be a part of 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 us and um in terms of 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 gains as well you know as much as there are negative and positive um aspects of 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 fake news other people tend to gain as well like for instance taking into consideration you mentioned the the um you know bad journalism that 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 journalist who published the story of 10 babies you know, most of us, you know, didn't know that, you know, there was someone called Peter, but he got exposure through that story. So basically, I believe, or I also believe that, you know, he he, he gained exposure as well. So um, thank you very much for 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 um for that as well. Um, colleagues, we're going to hand over to um, Lisanda. I'm not sure if, sorry. Um, Luandile, Luandile, are you are you back with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We're now going to hand over to um Luandile. Over to All you, right. Luandile. Um, there's not too much I have to add, considering that a lot was already mentioned. But before I do mention uh fake news, I just wanted to quickly touch on um implications of social media on the youth, because currently um in this day and age that we live in. That's where a lot of fake news is spread. <clears throat> and like a lot of things in life, uh, social media has positive and negative implications. And some of the positive implications is that we have exposure to so many new opportunities, like information and jobs that we didn't know existed. Um, it increases our social awareness. We can improve self-confidence. Is an amazing uh, platform to showcase our talents and it also helps to build our personal brands. But on the other side, negative implications include um, cyberbullying, which may lead to mental health issues like depression and maybe even suicide. And that many teens become too open on social media and end up sharing personal information. Um, in terms of fake news, uh, there is a lot has been said already, but I, what I did want to add is that for a long time, fake news has already been such an has has been an underlying issue. It was always there, but it wasn't always such a an issue that was at the forefront of society. But um, it has been brought to light as of recently because of uh, the global pandemic that we're currently experiencing, COVID nineteen. And the sad reality is that even now, during the fourth industrial revolution, where we can, we, where we have, where most of us have the ability to check the, the credibility. And the reliability of a source, we still choose to believe sources that are not reliable, such as WhatsApp voice notes. I know that um, last year when we had our friends, South Africa had their, our first uh, COVID patient and uh, South, Africa, South Africa was having its first few cases, I remember that there was a, a WhatsApp voice note circulating that, uh, of, uh, a WhatsApp voice note circulating telling people that uh, there are rumors going around that the government plans on shutting down the country and that everyone should go and buy food and be prepared. And the result of this, even though this turned out to be true, this caused um, unnecessary panic and fear to a point where people started panic buying to a point where if you went into a supermarket, all the shelves would be empty. Um, and because we receive such an overload of information, it also sometimes becomes difficult to distinguish between real news and fake news. Um, else? I like to Sanda mentioned earlier, we also don't realize the role that we play. Like she mentioned uh, with her example of Twitter, we don't realize the role that we play in spreading fake news because once we start to share something, we start to gaslight it and it gains momentum and it gains exposure and that's how it um, becomes more popular and people start to believe it, whether it's fake news or not. Um, and over time, fake news has become such a dangerous situation. It's, as we've seen now, it's become more of a 
life and death situation because of COVID. Um, I remember even another WhatsApp voice note that has been that has circulated before of where if people were saying if you, you shouldn't get tested because if you do get tested, uh, you get infected with some of the virus and, and things like that. Um, but just quickly, I, I just also wanted to mention that one thing I feel is that I feel like people need to be taught from a young age. We also need to be taught as adults because a lot of adults also don't know this, but we need to be taught from a young age, social media etiquette and how to distinguish real news from fake news, what the do's and don'ts of social media and why uh, they are that way, just to avoid uh, having the problems that we do. Are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Okay. Um. Thank you. Thank you very much for um your input. You know, it's 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 so nice to hear these from you know uh, the perspective of of youth. Um, you know, because these are, are issues that are, are affecting them on a, on a daily basis. And um, Lysanda also mentioned that, you know, um, on Twitter, both of them, Lysanda, actually Lysanda and, and um, Luandile mentioned that, you know, since most of them are on Twitter, you know, it, it, that's where, you know, most of these fake news are, are, are distributed. And Luandile also mentioned, you know, um, WhatsApp, you know, the messages that we get on WhatsApp, how many of us are getting, you know, um, chain messages that we just forward to the next person without actually checking the credibility. And I also agree with her that, you know, media and, and, and digital literacy are essential for, for, for people to, 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 to be acquainted with skills on how to, to evaluate information before actually sharing that information to, to check the credibility. Okay, um, now we're going to hand over to our last uh, panel member and um, her name is Catherine uh, Langsford, uh, who is passionate about literacy and education. She has worked as a high school teacher, high school English teacher, materials developer, a researcher, a lecturer and a digital learning specialist. Catherine currently serves as national chairperson of the Literacy Association of South Africa, known as LITASA, and she is a PhD candidate in education at the University of Cape Town. Catherine also um, has a, a, a master's degree in English and also has another one in development studies. She loves film, chocolate. Um, I think we're on the same page there. And uh, she also la likes to travel whenever she can. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Dina. Thank you. Yeah, just this, this is such a stimulating session and so many excellent points that have been made. So I think I'm just going to elaborate uh, on a couple of them uh, because so many have been covered already. I think for me, I want to come at this conversation from the issue of prevention. I think we've heard a lot about uh, pe what people's experience of fake news is and, and the aftermath of um, fake news, I suppose, in a sense. Uh, but I think prevention is always better. And I think legislation should be our, our point of last resort rather than the place that we start from. It's important, of course, but surely we should begin farther up the chain than uh, right at the end of it. And I think I want to ask a difficult question and I would like us to consider the difficult question of whose responsibility is it to educate people about uh, fake news and about information and media and digital literacy because it's it's very easy for us to say there should be programs people should be teaching this it should be important but who who should be teaching this and coming from an education perspective and an education background and a literacy background I ask myself this question a lot um, and before I unpack that a bit more what I'd like to do is to think about uh, the, the different types of literacies that have been touched on earlier today and information literacy, media literacy, 
um, digital literacy, and then of course meta literacy, uh, as Dr. Chitita um, touched on earlier. Because I think there are small but important differences between them, and we often are not aware of them, or we are not considering those differences, and that can impact how we look at the, at fake news and look at the education that can help to prevent the spread of fake news. Um, so my understanding of information literacy is the ability to think critically about information, to manage how we use information, and to consider how we use it, um, uh, both by taking it in and by sharing it, uh, and, and the production of knowledge and information. So verifying it, analyzing it, thinking critically about it. But media literacy is about being able to move between different mediums, so, so different media, and being able to know the skills and the knowledge and the ways of navigating different media. So if we think about it, the way that we use YouTube on a computer is completely different to how we work with a radio. Or um, when we're using a web page on the internet, the way that we'll search for information is different to how we would search in a book. They use similar skills and similar reading skills, specifically comprehension skills, but there are also significant differences. And that's a really important fact that we need to be thinking about too. Um, and the last thing is around digital literacy. So digital literacy, in my understanding, is understanding how to use digital tools. So understanding that, for example, if you see a little rubbish bin uh, icon, that means delete. That's a skill that we learn through using digital resources and digital tools. Uh, understanding how email works, what an inbox is, what clicking send means, what actions are going to come as a result of that, what an internet browser is, what a search engine, a set of search engine results are. All of these things are skills and knowledge that, that people need in order to be able to communicate and work effectively in, in the modern world. Uh, and just to say that there isn't clarity on what these different types of literacies are, even amongst researchers and in the research community, people have different understandings of what these types of literacies are. So what some people may think is digital literacy, others may think is information literacy or media literacy. And I think that's important as well, is to acknowledge the different understandings and what do we do with all of these different understandings. So that brings me back to whose responsibility is the teaching of these skills and, the, and uh, fostering and developing skills within these different types of literacy. And I think this is where, why I'm saying it's a difficult question, because uh, often people want to give the job to the person next to them, if you know what I mean. So uh, governments will say it's parents' responsibility, parents will say it's the school's responsibility, schools will say that it's uh, society's responsibility. And so it's convenient for us to pass the buck in a sense. But it also speaks to a deeper issue, which some of the other speakers have, have touched on, and that is around how we use and access these technologies. So there's a difference between public technologies or publicly accessed technologies and privately accessed technologies. And some research that I was part of last year um, really drew this uh, into uh, or highlighted it for me in ways that I hadn't thought about before. And that's around uh, so things like some forms of social media, like uh, Twitter, like Facebook, like um, Instagram, they are publicly accessed. So as a parent, you are able to follow your child's uh, profile and you're able to see what they are posting. And in a way, you can um, monitor whether what they are engaging with is uh, OK or whether you're uh, uh, happy with it or whether what they are posting is acceptable. I suppose schools could do that as well. That brings up a whole lot of issues around uh, privacy and, and uh, violation of that. Uh, but there is a way of monitoring it in a sense. But so uh, other platforms, particularly like WhatsApp are, or WhatsApp, are actually more frightening in the sense that they are closed and they are uh, private spaces. So as a parent, you can't always join a group that a child is part of, or you can't... Um, be part of the conversations that your child is having without um, 
doing it uh, in in a way where you ask them to show you their phone and you actually go through the messages, or if you do it um, by accessing their phone without their knowledge. Again, there's huge issues around privacy and about uh, protections and, and that kind of thing. But those spaces are, are hidden in a sense, and they're actually more concerning, I think, for the youth because WhatsApp is so widely used and it is um, easier to access in that you often get WhatsApp bundles or people can afford to use WhatsApp, but it's a, an area that we can police less or we can monitor less. And that's a greater concern for me about the spread of fake news. So those are yeah something to think about. The other thing that we also often do is say, oh, the younger generation, they're digital natives, they just understand. They pick up a, a phone or they pick up a, a, an electronic device and they just know what to do. But actually, there's a lot of research that shows that they don't. They might, might understand the digital literacy aspect of it, so how to navigate the thing, how to find settings, how to change things. But those information and media literacy skills, they don't have, they do need direct instruction on that. And so they aren't able to just naturally verify information or analyze it or apply critical thinking. And those are skills that need to be taught. So again, I come to the question of whose responsibility is it? So if we say it's the responsibility of, of the school, if it's uh, the education department's responsibility, then there's a whole lot of questions that we need to ask around how are we going to do this? And obviously the curriculum is a huge issue. So where does it fit into the curriculum? Should it be part of a language class? Should it be part of a special subject that we create? Is it something that should span across all of the subjects? And how are we going to do that then? How are we going to write that into the curriculum if that's the way that we should go? Um, should it be a, an additional subject that we create? Um, what are the implications there in terms of staffing and uh, time in the curriculum and developing a whole new subject within the curriculum? And then there are the deeper issues that come out as well around infrastructure. And, uh, you know, do we have the kind of infrastructure and uh, access to the internet and access to technologies that we would need in order to teach skills that the digital and media literacy skills that go with this um, entire kind of meta literacy that we're speaking about. And that's a big issue because we know we are very familiar with the digital divide in this country. We are very familiar with difficulties around accessing the internet and accessing technologies and, and um, differing different societies, um, as a previous speaker was speaking about, and how we access things in different ways in South Africa according to the sections of society that we belong to. And so if we really want to engage with this issue and we really want to teach digital literacy skills and information and media literacy skills, we're going to have to have that discussion. And it's not an easy discussion and it's not a, an inexpensive discussion and it's not a short term discussion. So again, whose responsibility is it to do this kind of work? I think uh, if we be, if we believe that it belongs within the education system and within the education department, then there's another issue around professional development. As I was saying, we often believe that young people are digital natives, they'll just understand how to use these technologies and they don't. But then that also begs the question of do the adults who are teaching them understand the technologies themselves and have the information and media and digital literacy to be able to show younger people how to engage with these uh, uh, literacies and how to develop these literacies. And often the case is not. So some of the findings from our research last year showed that the, the platforms that adults are on, particularly Facebook and WhatsApp, are not always the platforms that young people are on. And so um, adults are feeling comfortable with particular forms of technology and particular types of social media, but those are not the social media that young people are on. Therefore, they don't have the knowledge and skills to develop young people's abilities to understand the social media platforms that they are using. So there's an issue. And there's also, um, I'm sure those of you who are on mo multiple forms of social media or, mo or multiple platforms know that there are slight differences between them and, and different ways that people engage. And so it's not just to say, well, we can just teach one set of skills and everything will be okay across the board. It's not like that. 
And in fact, fake news is only one small section of uh, disinformation and misinformation. And um, some skills are transferable, but some skills are very specifically needed for the different types of misinformation and disinformation. Um, and being able to read it across uh, different platforms and know how to deal with it is different uh, across different platforms. And not only on social media, but there are internet sites that um, you know are parody sites or they use information or news that looks legitimate or was legitimate in the past, but they manipulate it ever so slightly so that if it's used now, it's the information is incorrect, but previously it was correct. Or um, things like deep fakes, which are particularly concerning. So the, the videos that are manipulated to look real and um, they are in fact not real at all. And this again is re relying on adults or um, a generation who didn't grow up with this, didn't develop the skills as young people, who are trying to develop the skills in themselves while teaching young people. And sometimes, as we know, young people often are better acquainted with a platform than the adult is. So there's a, a lot of um, tension there. And that brings me back to whose responsibility is this? I think it's everyone's responsibility to uh, develop themselves and develop their understanding. Um, but if we're going to be serious about developing uh, analytical skills and critical thinking skills in young people, we're going to have to look at are we doing it in the education system? If not, who is doing it and how is the information being shared and um, made accessible to young people? And this may be something that civil society needs to take up and work on more uh, if, if we can't fit it into the education curriculum. So there's a lot of personal ownership and personal responsibility on parents, on civil society, on education institutions uh, independently to address this issue. Um, and I think it's really important because we need in Africa to move from being consumers of uh, of technology and of digital resources to being producers. And so we're not only preparing people to deal with what's coming at them, but also how to responsibly create resources and, and uh, tools that other people can use, but that are protective and that do prevent um, uh, the possibility of misinformation and disinformation. And then that's an additional set of skills, not only to understand, but also to create um, these resources. So I think it's a, it's a really tricky time um, and, it, and it's requiring a lot of knowledge and uh, understanding from all levels of society. And I think it's something that we're going to have to think about carefully for a very long time. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for that um, thought-provoking um, presentation. And um, in terms of, of, of the, the media literacies that you, you touched on, indeed, I agree with you that the, 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 oh, the, these terms, the terminology for, for these uh, literacies, they are used interchangeably, which then leads to, to misunderstanding, because what I would find as uh, what I would define as a digital literacy. Another person can see that as, as a media literacy. And, um, you know, you also touched on the issue of, of resource, uh, lack of resources, you know, disparities. That also takes us back to what um, Dr. Bonono uh, deliberated on, that how do we then um, start to engage on, on matters such as, you know, digital literacy skills, whereas, you know, we are so much overshadowed by, you know, the digital divide. There's a lot of disparities, you know, and how, how do we then start with, you know, um, the how do we start the conversation of um, inclusive, um, you know, education in terms of these uh, literacies, whereas, you know, there's, there's, there's so much um, disparities in our in our society. So that makes one one ponder on, on what still needs to be done for, for us to reach a level where we can say we are now ready to 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 um to educate you know the society in terms of various literacies that can curb the spread of 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 of, of fake news. Okay um colleagues um all our panelists have have, have deliberated and shared on their experiences so now we are going to open the floor to everyone who would like to engage with with our 
panel members, you can um, unmute yourself or you can use the, the chat option to engage with, with the panelists. The floor is now open for, for questions and comments. Okay, I see that we have Ngosi. Ngosi, the floor is yours. Okay, th thank you, Tina. I, I would like to engage with Dr. Chesita's presentation. Uh, there were those interesting strategies that can be used to weaken the the impact of, of, of fake news. Uh, it mentioned to them, it unpacked them a bit, but when it came to the last one, which is information hygienic practices, I think he ran out of time. I would like some more clarity on that one. Would he impact that a bit? Thank you, Rina. Dr. Chisita. Thank you. Uh, when I uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Gossi, uh when I was talking about the uh, you know information hygienic practices, uh, in fact they resonate well with uh, what the other, uh, even the previous speaker, uh, Ms. Langford, uh, talked about because it's the key point there is uh, the evaluation, critical evaluation of information before you share it. But it also includes, uh, you know, uh, other things that have to do with information management, you know, uh, techniques that have to do with the um, uh, information management. When we uh, clean uh, information, when we uh, distill information. So, but basically it's, it's you know, the, the practice whereby we, the key thing there is to be able to evaluate uh, the information before uh, sharing it or, or click, clicking the button to share. I, I don't know whether that suffices. Thank you very much, Dr. It does, it suffices really. Thank you, okay. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments for our panelists, colleagues? You can unmute yourselves. Uh, okay, I see somebody. Let me. Yes. Okay, um, Merli Hodges. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name um correctly. Please forgive me. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the term that came across all the the presenters' um, presentations is the term critical thinking and critical thinking skills. And I'm wondering what um, the understanding is of critical thinking. How do they define critical thinking? What should the skills be of critical thinking? And like the last um, speaker has said, Whose responsibility is that um, to be able to teach that? So I would like to them to venture in the understanding of critical thinking. Okay, uh, our panelists, can we have your engagement regarding that? Oh, okay. I will just uh, start. Uh, well, critical thinking is a skill that, uh, you know, when we interact with the text uh, and any other media formats, uh, be, be they uh, sound, text, uh, images, uh, you know, recordings, whatever it is, uh, we see we are not a passive recipients of information. I think if we go back to some fundamental theories like the reader response theory, uh, it states that uh, a, the reader or the viewer or the listener is not a passive recipient uh, of any information because uh, they have their own cognitive perceptive uh, levels which they bring into a discourse and this help in the analysis of whatever 
uh, meanings that they are engaging or phenomenon that they are engaging in. And that knowledge that they have helps them to uh, interpret that phenomenon. So we, when we interpret or engage with the phenomenon, we don't go into that uh, engagement with a, a blank mind or tabula rasa mind, but our mind has certain impressions that we have developed uh, through time and space. So meanings are at various level. You know, the connotations, the denotations, you know, surface, you know, uh, you know, uh, level, different levels. So it depends when we uh, get or engage with a text. It depends at what level are we interpreting uh, that uh, text or that, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a recording or whatever it is. At what level are we interpreting it? Are we only interpreting it at the surface level? Because there is more beyond the surface level. Uh, there is more beyond the text or the sound that we see as we go deeper. So critical uh, uh, literary skills uh, or critical, critical meta literary skills are skills that able you to weigh uh, phenomenon uh, look at the negative and the positive, you are able to also, uh, let's say dealing with newspapers, you're able to know this is, uh, who owns this uh, uh, media house, uh, what's the editorial policy, uh, who wrote this story, uh, do they have knowledge, uh, what's their background in writing about uh, this story, you see, etc. All, all those skills they help in the interpreting of, uh, you know, phenomenon. Uh, I don't know whether I can go any further uh, on that. I think let me come in on the heels of Dr. Chisita and say that uh, I think from, from my vantage point, um, uh, critical thinking, as I said, I think uh, people are audiences are not passive, um, as the doctor has said. Audiences aren't, aren't passive. And so um, I think we have to realize that inherently people are critical thinkers. Uh, and the reason why sometimes they choose to um, interpret is, and it's always within context, uh, things in a certain way, is because there's a sort of, uh, some sense of gain um, um, to be uh, factored in. Because, you know, um, understanding a certain, um, a certain truth in a certain way is because of a sense of gain that can that can be accrued, um, and so uh, what I, I I would offer in terms of uh, greater critical thinking. So my first point is that people are critical thinkers, and then secondly, um, to to th there's uh, I think literacy, as as has been touched on, is important when it comes to, um, um, and and then encouraging people to be. To, to, to be more critical, um, all right. But I, I think I would point I would point to the fact that um, in 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 uh, educating people about you know this this current iteration of of, of fake news, that's when uh, uh, the education system becomes important, all right. But then in again and 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 and, and having mentioned that, um, the divisions within the education system something to be factored in as well. Um, so you can you can uh, educate people about um, this is this is sometimes this is fake news this is clickbait uh, this is that but people think within their social worlds and so I think for me it then comes comes down to the fact that there's 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 these like uh, big social structures that we have to deal with and and encourage critical thinking um, within those understandings but we have to do the work of of of, of breaking down. Those structures, because I think um, groups are held within silos. Um, they're held within um, bubbles of information. And uh, uh, as much as I advocate for, as much as I advocate for um, awareness programs and, and and literacy programs, right? I think we have to deal with um, the big structures as well, making sure that if we are going to say it's literacy, um, um, as 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 has been pointed out, then where is that literacy going to come going to come from? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to go down and 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 touch in like rural schools and township schools 
right? So I think even in, in, in a discussing critical thinking, um, our social structures become a big part of the conversation. Okay. Um, Catherine, you wanted to say something earlier on? Uh, yeah, I wanted to add to that and say um, uh, the beauty is that in the languages curriculum across the world, there are uh, sort of questions that are quite regularly used that will develop critical thinking skills. Uh, and I think that that um, is being used in many schools already. And of course, the why question, you know, why in, in any situation, if children are reading a book or reading a textbook, why is this information there? What's, uh, why is it important? That's already critical thinking. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, critical thinking is looking at what was the author's purpose in writing this? Uh, what? Who is the target audience? What bias is there or stereotype or prejudice that's represented in the text? Um, you know, what is the purpose of this text? Who? Who is likely to read it? Is there uh, what what is fact and what is opinion in the text? And a lot of these questions have been in language curriculums for decades already. It's not as if they haven't been treated. But I think for me, again, is the issue. It's, it's not then applied to media literacy or in digital literacy spheres. So we're building those skills when we're talking about print texts, but we're not building those plus the specific skills that are different in digital and, and um, media literacy. And I think uh, if we look particularly at youth in, in uh, basic education, until we find ourselves in a position that the curriculum mandates uh, um, engagement with texts that are digital uh, beyond just an email, which they have to write, often on paper, ironically, um, until the curriculum mandates it, I don't know how many people will naturally include digital texts or include processes that force children to look at digital um, literacy and media literacy aspects of information literacy. But yeah, there are there are standard questions about analyzing data information about where it comes from. Can you find a date? Who published it? Many of the things that have been discussed already. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, comments, colleagues? Uh, Machina, do you wanted to say something earlier on? Okay. Can I just come back? Okay. Can I just come back to the critical thinking? I think okay. we need to think very deeply about our understanding of critical thinking. Because for me, it is not only the understanding of text, whether it's digital or media or written, it is also how you interact with the world in terms of your thinking. And that, once you've read the text, and you've read it critically, you must also be able to verbalize your thinking. You must also be able to argue your, your thinking. And their skills like um, you, your claims, your rebuttals, your counterclaims. And they've shown, the research has shown, that because of Western scientific thinking and African traditional thinking, there's different ways of thinking critically. And um, and because of Ubuntu, we do not have the skills to be able to claim and rebut. And it's, even teachers don't have that ability. So I think that is a, an area that I think is very, very unresearched and very undeveloped. And I think I would like the, the, uh, us to be able to say that it's our responsibility to understand what we understand by critical thinking how we should teach it and how we should assist people to argue critically as well. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, is there anyone who'd like to engage on that further on, on the critical skills aspect? Okay, um, earlier on, um, Catherine asked um, a question. She basically asked, 
you know, as to who is responsible for imparting knowledge or raising awareness of, 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 of fake news, of, of teaching, you know, ways on how to, 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 to curb, you know, the, both the creation and distribution and consumption of, of fake news. So we'll just like to hear from both the panelists and, you know, um, our, our guests, who do you think, are, who, who's actually responsible for that? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you are audible. I think I want to maybe add on to that. I think it's everyone. When I say everyone, I talk in terms of the whole thing of um, attacking the fake news um, and everything. It's a matter of there are different approaches to the different um, people we have in society. For instance, yes, you can add um, literacy in terms of you know, maybe in schools, like um, basic education schools. But when you add that literacy to the youth, let's say I'm looking at a university level, university students have access to information, but they do not use it. They don't engage in it because the approach to it is not, I don't know the word to use. It, 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 it's not, it doesn't grab my attention. There, there is knowledge. You, I, I'm, I'm hearing the um, doctor. You know, he, 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 he stated facts, things that have already been there. But as the, as the youth, especially university students, we don't take it upon ourselves because now you're talking about I must go and research. So it's also about the approach. Yes, you can use that approach when it comes to basic education because our the mindset there isn't. But I have an option not to actually engage. But with the with the youth, it's a matter of, no, what is the approach? Who's actually having this conversation? Is it just only Sanda, someone who's from a small town? Or is it someone, is it an influencer, someone who's well-known and is well-respected that has that conversation, who then makes me, okay, now I'm attracted to it. So I think it's a matter of, it's everyone's responsibility, not just one particular um, group of people, but also the approach as to how it's done. I think that's all from my side. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone would like to add on that? You can unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I agree with um, the other speaker uh, there, uh, Nazo. I think uh, education, these uh, skills are part of education uh, because education does not only take place in formal. Uh, uh, you know, uh, environments, but it also formal and informal uh, situations, you know, physical spaces, you know, digital spaces. So uh, the other maybe critical issue there that is at stake is that uh, uh, while, the, you know, our society, there's been sort of like a, a, a sort of like a, a barrier to intergenerational dialogue. It's the intergenerational dialogue because uh, uh, intergenerational dialogue is useful in the sense that uh, you know the aged and the young are different demographic groups and uh, when they interact or their platforms for their interaction they can be able to uh, uh, empower each other with knowledge and skills pertaining to you know, uh, you know, various aspects of life. For example, as the other speaker said, the young ones are taking a survey, et cetera, but even though they lack the skills on evaluating uh, information. So uh, other countries are using these intergenerational platforms to promote, uh, you know, a, a knowledge about uh, fake news so that you bridge the gap uh, between the young uh, and the old. And also the fact that, uh, uh, you know, socialization, the education of an individual starts from the home. And uh, even though it goes into other, you know, uh, secondary, you know, uh, institutions for socialization, uh, like the digital space and etc. So strengthening the family, uh, uh, you know, bond and stability, I think is also another key, uh, you know, uh, character. And also the fact that 
uh, education is not a responsibility of uh, one person. You know, from an African perspective, it's a responsibility of uh, everyone uh, in the in the in the community. So we have different stakeholders, uh, the government, uh, development partners, we you know families, communities, etc., opinion leaders, and etc. So I agree that it's it's a more like a shared responsibility since we are living in what we can call a zone of shared freedoms and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Collins. I also agree with um, the speakers, and I've also been going through the chats, um, the, the the messages on the chats. I also agree to uh, a large extent that you know it's it's not just for um, you know only school teachers or librarians. It's 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 for everyone in the in the society because you know there's a saying that you know goes like it takes a village to 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 raise a child. So each and every one of us have have a role to play because at the end of the day we are all affected, or we are all affected by this, um, you know, the, the the fake news aspect. So each and every one of us have have a responsibility, and and a, a role to 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 play in that manner. Um, any 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 comments, um, colleagues from the floor? Anyone would like to add anything related to what has what we have been engaging on today? Um, Dina, can I add something up around the role of media as well? Um, because they they're kind of in a an interesting space. They can be both the promoters of of fake news and misinformation, and also. Um, be the one, the consumers in a sense. So, what role does media play? Um, and you know, if we if we hold them up to a standard and we are criticizing them, are we using social media to criticize them and therefore spreading the fake news even more? To come back to the point one of the speakers made earlier about we we should look at the role that we are playing. So, how many of us shared information about the decouplets? You know, because often what happens is people will read a message or see something and instead of saying oh no this isn't you know this looks like fake news i'm not going to share it what they do is say can you believe it oh i have to share this with so and so to to they will never believe it either and we're doing exactly the opposite of what we should be doing so we can criticize media but what is our own role and also how are we engaging as the public with media uh, around this issue hmm. Exactly, that's true. You know, like I'm guilt. I'm also guilty of that. I have shared, you know, uh, you know, inform, especially when it comes to the, you know, the recent uh, one, the the ten, you know, um, the twins. So, um, yeah. So all of us, you know, as, as much as we are pointing fingers, we are also to blame in 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 you know spreading fake news. Um, Dr. Collins, I see there. Um, uh, I, I think that was a historical end. <laughs> Hello. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments, our colleagues, for our panelists? Uh, uh, hi, Dina. Hi. Uh, th th thank you very much. You know, um, interestingly, uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, we had the national state of uh, disaster. And, and 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 in it, uh, it included that any medium such as SMS, WhatsApp, Twitter, videos, and other messaging on 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 uh, social media is prohibited. And 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 I think sometimes we have a tendency to to not. I think it's a society, it's a societal uh, matter, not to deal with things until you know they are criminalized and 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 later they become law. And 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 I, I I think in homes and in schools in churches, uh, uh, we, we should begin to deal with the issue of fake news because I think these things are distributed, and from time to time you you hear that uh, someone uh, uh, was defamed and and eventually they killed themselves or something happened, so we we, we have a duty, uh, 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 as society to ensure that uh, whatever we distribute, 
you know, uh, there are systems where you are able to check it. Because I think we are we, we are so uh, obsessed with likes or or sensationalization on, on, on social media that once you see something, you, you want to be the first to, to actually pass it to, to the next person. And and I think this is something that as as, as parents, uh, we should begin to, you know, to, to keep it in homes. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I've just mentioned in the charts that if if you are going to buy a try your child, for example, a gadget that 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 you know that will be able to distribute and, uh, or access in, internet, uh, there's a possibility that now they are going to begin to engage with certain things, and 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 they are also uh, are possible uh, uh, possible victims of of of, um, of 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 fake news. So somehow um, we should we should maybe continue to talk because I think it's, it's, it's a subject that is af affecting mostly this generation. Uh, myself being a little bit older and, and, and generations that came before me might not be, you know, successful to, to these gadgets. But, but I think my son who is 14 years, this is going to be a problem for him going forward because now things are easy to share, easy to access. So somehow, uh, we should we should be able to deal with societal ills that are to come in the future. So our work now should be to say, as universities, as institutions like Broadway said, schools, churches, to say what is likely to come as a problem in, in the future. And 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 I think uh, the issue of fake news is, is is distribution of fake news. Eventually, it will be criminalized. And later we'll see our young people with criminal records because they've shared something that they were not supposed to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Marcus. Um, any other comments, colleagues? I see um, Prof. Um, Lynette. Dina, thank you very much. I just also want to uh, throw so something into the discussion. I think it's also important that we distinguish between fake news and less fake news, because I don't think anything is completely true. But then also to understand that um, we have different views and perceptions. Now, I think the problem comes in if we expect everybody to think alike that is problematic at the same time when we take somebody else's views and perceive it as the gospel truth that is then also problematic so for me there's a difference between views raised on social media and information shared as if they are facts and because if we also do not entertain different viewpoints that would be a sad day but thank you for the session and thank you for the panelists it was excellent thank you so much um pro for your for your inputs much appreciated any other comments or, or inputs um colleagues hello Hello. Hello. Uh, doc, Dr. Collins? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the previous speaker, I think, also said it well because there's a need for diversity, you know, in terms of opinions and uh, views. Uh, so sometimes uh, we, you know, need to have, there needs to be a proper strategy on how to deal with this phenomenon uh, of fake news because. Uh, people should be able to learn how to distinguish between uh, facts uh, and opinion. Uh, if we say, uh, let's say the United States invaded uh, Iraq or a country in the Middle East, it's a fact. But uh, what they did there becomes an opinion, you see. So uh, diversity in terms of uh, opinions, I think it's, it's, it's healthier. And uh, the onus is then also on how can information professionals and also related and other professionals uh, work together to ensure uh, 
you know, safety on, on, on these digital uh, platforms. And uh, especially, you know, like the one of the critical, especially during the COVID, has been that of uh, health. And uh, because of the proliferation of bogus uh, health information, which then undermines the scientific information. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Collins. Um, colleagues, it seems like we have <laughs> exhausted um, you know, our time. It has really been a fruitful um, session. Um, and, you know, I don't know about you colleagues, but I have gained so much um, knowledge and awareness in terms of, of the fake news. And it has, you know, definitely changed uh, the way I, I perceived, you know, fake news. So uh, before we, 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 we wrap up, I'd like, I'd like to hand over to uh, Mr. Buti Sikwi to do the, the vote of thanks. Over to you, Mr. Buti. Oh, afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, Good Ms. afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are audible. Oh. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I can't thank you individually, but firstly, I would like to thank the distinguished panelists with a whole wealth of information that was provided here. So it gave us an opportunity to learn further and to discuss further more on this issue of fake news. And where does it end? That's the question. Should we engage basic Department of Education to have it some, something for the school? Because cyberbullying also begins there. That's point for another matter. Another thing also to, just to, to share or to thank you is fake news. Really, it is way. With that, that is very informative. I will want to take more time of you. With that, I would like to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Till we meet again. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sikwi. Um, colleagues, uh, without wasting any more time, that brings us to the end of, of our session. Um, you know, to add on to what my colleague has just said, we'd like to thank you for availing yourself and honoring the invitation and have, you know, uh, a blessed weekend further. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.